throughout my day. Well, I just want to praise his name all along that way. Yes, he has been so good to me, so faithful and kind. That's why I want the world to know I got Jesus on my mind. Well, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. choose to trust him cause he always brings me out yes he is always with me and he's always on time that's why I want the world to know I got Jesus on my mind
take my cross to Calvary, oh, no, yeah. pay the price for all yeah. my guilty. Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, he makes a way. Need an answer to the questions of fear and the why. Somebody here is desperate for freedom from the past, the chains, and the lies. Feel like you wasted much time wanna move ahead but you're still last in line feel running will never end and you will never
is wanting to give up. Somebody here, you've been ready to quit. But my God says, wait, hold on. This thing, it ain't over yet. Well, if we'll just, just for, turn out uh, our clocks back just a little bit to last night. Uh, we was preaching last night. Listen, some of us may say, Lord, I, God, God I'm, I'm falling, but this man, amen. Uh, Lord, I'm failing, but this man, amen. Lord, I'm fainting, but... This man, amen. Listen, this man is the only man that's able to do it all. And listen, I know the man that they're singing about tonight. So I praise God for that tonight. That no matter what's going on in our life, there's still hope for the Christian tonight. We ain't out of this thing yet. I thank God for that tonight. I appreciate you being in the house of the Lord tonight. I appreciate the singing tonight, what God's done through the good spirit. I want to do something tonight. We always come and pray uh, here at the church. But I want to ask you to do something special tonight. Uh, during our prayer time, uh, I told you last night about my brother-in-law, and uh, he has no doubt had some improvement, uh, but there's another young man in our community, uh, Garrett Whitfield, very young man in his 30s, and uh, they right now, while we're speaking, at 6.30, they may, they may be done by now, I'm not sure, they were having a big prayer meeting over in the parking lot of Duke Regional Hospital tonight for Garrett, and he's having a tough time, and uh, he, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> He's right here in our community. And Jane was texting his wife or messaging his wife uh, back and forth today and told her we could not be there for the prayer meeting tonight because of our revival. But she told her this. She said there will be an army praying for you all tonight at the church. And uh, I want the army to pray tonight for Garrett Whitfield. And I want them to pray for Philip, for my brother-in-law tonight, and others that are sick and going through the stuff we're going through. Listen, I want an army to pray for our nation tonight. I want an army to pray for our churches tonight. I want an army to pray for our pastors and our evangelists tonight. I want an army to pray for our kids tonight. We need something in this country to stir us up and wake us up for God and get on fire for God. Listen, we, we're the only ones going to get our way out of this. We, we can't depend on anybody else to get us out of this. It's going to take God to get us out of it, amen. And it's going to take the church being on fire, God's men being on fire, God's people being on fire. It's going to take an army praying to get this thing done, amen. And so as we have prayer tonight, right now, I want all that can and will either get around this altar and pray or pray where you are tonight. But I want you praying for these requests tonight and begging God on behalf of these families. Father, God, we love you tonight. And, Father, we are thankful, God, for your good grace and for your great mercy that you've already bestowed upon us. And, God, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness, Lord, every day in our life. And, God, I pray tonight, Lord, that your will would be done in this place, God, above measure. I pray, God, you'd touch hearts and touch homes tonight. God, you'd heal broken homes and heal broken marriages tonight, heal broken relationships tonight, heal broken pastors tonight. God, you'd heal broken churches tonight. God, I just pray, God, that you'd rain down upon us, Father, in a mighty way. And God, I pray you'd make yourself real in our lives. And God, in the pews of this church tonight, God, and in the hearts of man tonight, and in the heart of the man of God that'll be preaching here in just a little bit, God, I pray you'd anoint him, God, from on high. And God, you'd fill him up tonight, and he'd pour himself out. Lord, on us tonight, God, with the power of God, Lord, upon his life, Father, and that your will would be done in all things. Father, I pray tonight, God, especially for these ones that we have called by name. Jane told Anna this afternoon that there'd be an army praying. And, God, we want to come together. Lord, as a mighty army tonight, we want to pray, God, that you'd reach down in that hospital room tonight. And God, you do what doctors can't do, and you do what medicines can't do, and you do what nurses can't do. And God, we, we, we respect them, and we appreciate them, and God, we honor all of them. 
But God, we beg you to do what they cannot do tonight, and that's heal him and lift him up. We pray for Philip tonight, God, you'd bless him and strengthen him. And God, I pray, Lord, you'd heal these men and raise them up and put them back at home with their families. Father, I pray for others that are going through trying times that are in the hospitals and families that's lost loved ones. And I, I pray for churches tonight that's battling. I pray for pastors tonight that are battling. I pray, God, you'd help them. God, give them strength and raise them up. And, Father, I pray that the church tonight would get back in the church and be the church. God, whether the pastor wants to go in there or not, let the church go back and, and be the church and do what they need to do. Father, we pray for your strength tonight. God, we pray for your mercy tonight. God, we pray for your kindness and your love toward us tonight. We pray that the power of God would be upon us and be upon the people in this building and be upon Brother Kidd tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, for the power of the songs already, how it stirred our heart and touched our hearts. And God, if there's one thing that we need to do tonight is tell others about our Jesus. And Father, I pray, God, that you'd help us above measure. You'd give us exactly what we need tonight. Say every word that needs to be said. Lord, just stop every word that should not be said tonight. And God, let us look to you for all leadership and guidance. And Father, you work your will in a way, God, that even we couldn't understand tonight. We believe, God, that there's just one man, one man, but this man is the only man uh, that could do these things, and his name is Jesus. Father, would you help us tonight? God, we glorify your name. We magnify you tonight. And God, we beg you to magnify and glorify yourself, God, through this church tonight and these people. And God, I pray that you'd be magnified and glorified going out of the building tonight. Go back in our homes and, Lord, back in our workplaces tomorrow. Lord, wherever it may be, we'd show forth Christ and somebody would know that we had been with the Lord and that you had shown down upon us. Father, we love you. We can't tell you enough how uh, what a privilege it is to come to serve you, Lord, once again and worship you, God, once again. Father, thank you for what you've done for us. God, we praise you for what you're going to do right now. Use us tonight for your glory. And we'll thank you and love you, Lord, for all things. And we ask all these things in Christ's wonderful name. And all God's children said, <clears throat> Well, we appreciate the army of God. We appreciate the people of God. We appreciate the church of God. Amen. And we appreciate those that will come together and pray. May we never take prayer out of the church house. Uh, they, listen, they've taken out of most places. It's embarrassing for churches to come together in prayer. We have people come to our church from time to time, and we call for altar prayer. And they said, I didn't know you still did that. Listen, you can take your altar out if you want to. We've not taken ours out. And as long as I'm the pastor here, they will not take it out. If they take, if they take the altar out, they can carry me out with it. Amen. We'll just all go together because we need the altar. And I thank God for that tonight. Thank you, choir, for the good songs tonight. We appreciate that. I just got a couple of quick announcements tonight, and I'm going to try my best to get out of the way and just let some singing be done. Brother Kidd, come and uh, preach tonight. But tomorrow night, listen, will be our last night here of the meetings. We appreciate what God has done <clears throat> Excuse me, this week. It's been, listen, we've had church this week. Amen. Amen. Especially these last couple of nights. Boy, God's moved in on us the last couple of nights. He's saved souls. He's searched hard. I cannot tell you. I, I've been getting texts and calls today about the meeting last night, and I appreciate that. I, listen, I, I thank you for every text, every call that I got today. Thank God uh, for that. God worked in the midst of that last night, and I appreciate uh, what the Lord did. Some of you got some help. I got some help from it. Amen. And I praise the Lord for it. <clears throat> Matter of fact, Brother Danny <clears throat> excuse, told me earlier, he said the devil tried to shut him down. Again this afternoon, he remembered the message from last night, amen. I'm not fainting, but why? But this man, amen. Uh, he is able, and I appreciate what God has done through that. Thank you for being here tonight. If you visit with us, you are our honored guest. We appreciate you being here, and pray that you'll come back tomorrow night. Bring somebody with you uh, tomorrow night. Let's fill this place up, pack it out uh, for the glory of God, and let's see something done uh, for God like people have never seen before in their entire life. And listen, don't forget Sunday morning. Here at the church, I'm going to plug this in. If you don't have a church home, I know where a church door will be open Sunday morning, amen, uh, with good teaching, good preaching, good singing, the Spirit of God 
uh, be there. Be, night, be at New Life Baptist Church, amen, 6413 Burlington Road. And we want to invite you to come and bring somebody with you on Sunday. We'd love to have you here uh, to worship with you. We appreciate the love you uh, in the Lord. And don't forget that uh, for the tomorrow night service. If you would, anything else tonight that I need to mention, Miss Kristen. All right, the youth Saturday at Brother Josh and Miss Christian. Y'all better go help Brother Josh out. Amen. Don't, that, next, that next sermon in the youth class is going to be tough. Amen. I can tell you that now, but I appreciate that. Youth come and help them out. Let me just say this to our church. Uh, boy, I appreciate our church. Uh, boy, you've been good. You've worked hard uh, this week. You've been faithful uh, this week. You've tried to get the people in, make everybody uh, comfortable. All these kids out here holding these signs and trying to encourage people. Uh, as it come in, thank you for everything you have done this week. I would hate to think I would want to try to do it without you, but I appreciate you and love you uh, in the Lord here at New Life Baptist Church. Thank you for my people coming last night uh, and being here to support us. We thank God for you tonight, and we love you and appreciate you greatly. Amen. Anything else at all, Mama? Anybody that can help them in the morning at 9.30, see Miss Carrie, okay, would be great. We appreciate that. Listen, they've had to clean the church uh, every day this week. I, if you're visiting, and our folks know this, when I come in this building, I want it clean. Amen. I'm a little peculiar about God's building, and uh, I want it clean when I come in the house of God. When you come in the house of God, I want it clean too. Uh, amen. I am a little, uh, little stickler, stickler over that. Amen. Go ahead, Mama. Amen. Yeah, yes, she volunteered, Brother Dwayne. Amen. I like that. Amen. Amen. You know what? You know what Dwayne told her when they left the house this afternoon? Amen. He said, Sugar, your, your dress looks nice. You look good. And don't go change it. If y'all remember the story last night, you know what I'm talking about. I left the house this afternoon, and uh, Jane had on one dress. She got here, she had on another. And I don't know how many times she changed before we got here. Brother Kid, you'd have been here last night to understand uh, all of that. We, we, had a, we, had, we, had, we about had marriage counseling before we got out of here last night. Amen. But we did have a good time. We did find out this. I didn't find a man in here that understood women. Amen. Hallelujah. But it was all good. I will tell you that. We didn't preach on that, but it sure was fun. Amen. Thank God for that. All right. Let's, uh, come on, Michael. Let's take an offering tonight. And uh, listen, I want to tell you again, thank you for your giving this week. Uh, every dime that's been taken up this week is going to, to the men of God, every dime. Uh, the church will not keep a dime of it, even last night. Uh, it's going to these men of God. I want you to know that. And so every dime you give is going to go directly to them and their ministry and them running up down the road to appreciate them and what they do. And so as we give the offering tonight, just remember you're giving to them. Uh, God's taking care of us here at the church, and we appreciate what you have done. And I want to say this to you, in all honesty, you have been gracious this week, and we thank God for that. And everything you give tonight will be going to Brother Kid, so let's come take an offer. Amen. All right, let's get our ushers to come uh, this, <laughs> this evening. Uh, while they come, you can return to page 120 in your songbook. We sing Victory in Jesus. Yeah. Victory in Jesus, page 120. Let's go to the Lord in prayer first and bless our offering before we do. Brother Chris, will you pray for us this evening, sir? Amen. Let's all stand 120. Victory in Jesus.
his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow can be seated tonight, and uh, Miss Myrtle Harris, if you would make your way on up here tonight, please. Miss Myrtle is going to sing a couple of songs for us just before Dr. Kidd comes and preaches for us tonight, and uh, I love her and the Lord, and I appreciate her being here with us uh, this week, singing in our choir with us this week. We appreciate that. Just before she sings tonight, I know we have at least one other pastor here tonight. His brother was here on Monday night. Uh, from Aaron's Creek Baptist Church. Brother, what is your name again? Brother Pruitt, right? Robert Pruitt. Robert Pruitt, Brother Pruitt, we appreciate you being here with us. Now, any other pastors here tonight? I didn't know if there was any others here or not. We don't want to leave you out, but I appreciate you coming and supporting us and being here with us uh, this week. Praise the Lord for it. And, uh, boy, it's good for churches to come together and uh, get in the glory of God. Amen. We, we need more of that. I can tell you that. Now, we appreciate that. But I appreciate Miss Myrtle. And I'm going to get her to come and sing for us tonight. Amen. You come on, dear. I didn't have no choice to sing tonight because he, to <laughs> he told me Tuesday night I couldn't get in the door unless I pay a price. And I told him I had become retarded so I didn't have no money. So, so y'all going to have to endure me, you know. <laughs> we go way back, way back. I have joined an army, it is mighty and strong, my battle cry is, I'm so blessed, don't worry. When I'm wounded, I'll get back to the fighting yeah. for my uniform is made of God's righteousness. Yeah. The enemy. 
enemy me knows he is already defeated the terms of surrendered were settled long ago I have taken my position behind the cross of Calvary. My orders are simple. Child, just hold on. When the time shall come for my relocation, there is only one song to be sung. Let the choir sing a victory and joy comes in the morning now I know oh soldier just left for home I am a soldier Got my sword and shield. I am ready to fight. I'm not afraid to step on any lowly battlefield. The on my side I'm not afraid to step on any lonely battlefield the great God of glory I thank God he's on my side. I'm telling you, it's been a lot of years since I've been saved, but I never forgot the day. Never forgot the day. I just want to take one little minute, just one little minute. My daughter's coming here to church. I hope I don't cry. She's been out of church 39 years. 39 years, Mama's been praying for my little Carolyn sitting here. Well, she ain't little Nana, but she's little to me. But <laughs> praying for her for 39 years. Last fall, when I went to her house. She's working from home. I went there, and I noticed I seen some loaf bread, some grape juice. And I thought, hmm, she must be having communion, but she hadn't told me she got her life straightened out. So I had an excuse to go back the next week to see what was happening, you and this Mama. So I went back, and I said, have you got your right life right with the Lord? She said, yes, Mama. We cried. We had our time. But you just don't know what it done to Mama's heart. To, if you're here today and you got loved ones lost, keep praying. Yeah. 39 yeah. years. Yeah. That's a lot of gray hair, I'm telling you. <laughs> and so I told her, come to this church. It was a good church. Hey. So I'm hoping she'll get a hen work. This is one of my favorite songs. I hope I can get it out.
What has happened to our nation? We used to fear the Lord to a people whose foundation was built upon God's word. We allow the world's opinion to chart a different way. But it's time the church of Jesus Christ should boldly stand and say, God's word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans. God's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to prevail in the hearts of men. God's word will stand. They can take it from the courthouse walls, remove it from the schools, teach our children that we're animals, speak against the golden rule, try to hide our Christian heritage from the public eye, but they never overcome God's word, no matter how they try. God's word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans. God's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to prevail in the hearts of men. God's word will stand. It's forever set on, to evermore endure. It's the only way a sinner's heart could ever be made pure. God's word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans. God's word will stand. Against the gates of hell, with power to prevail in the hearts of men, God's word will stand. God's word will stand. God's word will stand. anything at all. Miss Myrtle, I appreciate that tonight. Now y'all know why I was going to charge her, amen. That's worth any fee, worth more than any fee she could have paid coming through the door tonight. And because of that, we're going to let her come back tomorrow night. Hallelujah, amen. I appreciate her. I love her. We've been friends a long time. We do go back a long way. And I thank God for that. I thank God for all the great singing tonight. What a blessing we've had. And I'm glad that the Spirit of God will still move, amen. I'm glad we still have the Word of God to stand on, amen, from the pulpit in our homes and everywhere else. Listen, even today, I didn't have to go and defend the Word of God, but I had to tell somebody today, listen, if they ain't going to preach out of this book right here, and they ain't going to preach the Word of God, listen, they are following an association. They're not men called of God, amen. That's just bottom line. It's just the way it is, amen. And I appreciate what God does through that. I appreciate a dear friend of mine being here tonight. I appreciate him praying for me, sticking with me, sticking by my side, loving on me down through the years. I, I, listen, I just appreciate his friendship, and he's been one that stood with me down through the years. And listen, I have stood with him, and I thank God for that, that we can have men of God that will stand together, work together, preach together, love each other together, go after souls uh, together, want to see something done for this country. And I appreciate Dr. Kidd year after year. He comes here and, and, and is with us and preaches the gospel to us. There's never been a time that he didn't help our church. When he, I tell people that all the time. I said every time he's ever come here, he's been a help to our church. And that's why I call him year after year and put him back on schedule. So, because he comes here and helps our church. 
and I love him in the Lord. Dr. Kidd, I appreciate you, sir. I want you to come on and preach your heart out tonight. Preach what God's laid on your heart. Mother. I'm honored to be here. I love you. I love you. Thank you for letting me come. Thank you so much. Would you turn with me to the book of John, chapter number 11, please? John, chapter number 11. Brother, I'm going to depend on you for this pulpit. Is it working? Can you raise your hand if you can hear me? Raise your hand if you don't care. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Well, you've had a great meeting this week, and I'm so glad to hear the good reports of what's been going on. And don't forget tomorrow night. Man, come tomorrow night, Friday night. You miss church to go to the grocery store, and we'll pray God will your lettuce. I guarantee you. I want you to be here. I wouldn't miss tomorrow night if my mother-in-law was going to be here, and you'd have to know her. That's making a great commitment. Bring your mother-in-law. Bring your mother-in-law. Plenty of room out there to land her broom up and down that road right there. She could. Some of you fellas are impact. You won't even laugh at a good joke. But I love you, Pastor. He's such a great man, and his wife and family always enjoy the good singing here. Thank you for letting me come by. It's been two years since I've been here uh, because of everything that's been going on. But in John chapter number 11, let me get right into the message. <clears throat> I get paid by the hour, and he only bought 30 minutes, so I'm in a little bit of a hurry. I'm a union worker. John chapter number 11, verse number 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, uh, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. By the way, it was that Mary that uh, anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, here's what he said, he who thou lovest is sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, him who thou lovest is sick. In verse 3, when Jesus heard that, he said, this is what Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha, and he loved her sister, and he also loved Lazarus. Verse number 6, And when they heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after he spent two days not going in any direction, he said to his disciples, Let us go unto Judea again. Now look at verse number 20. So he turns around, two days journey, he goes back to Judea, and look at verse 20. This is what happened when he got there. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out to meet him. But Mary sat still in the house. That'll be all the scripture I read for sake of time. Pastor, thank you for coming. It's a great honor to meet you. It's so good to have you in our service tonight. We pray that God will bless you and your ministry and encourage you as a result of being here. You know the word Mary in the Bible means to be bitter, unforgiving, or rebellious. Most people don't know that or you wouldn't have named your daughter that, right? Because his mother's all over the building saying, I got a daughter that fits that. I want to tell you a few things about this girl named Mary. That's what I want to preach on is it her life tonight. Before I say something critical about her, I think it's just that I tell you a little bit about this Mary's background. We know that she came up from a very negative environment. She was into some sensuality and things that I wouldn't even mention, probably in a mixed congregation. We know she met Jesus and got born again. We're very sure of that. Amen. But this Mary was a special girl. <clears throat> she meant a lot to the Lord. If you'll study the geographical setting and the journeys of Jesus, you'll find that he passed through the town of Bethany more than any other town in Israel. It's about 7 to 12 miles outside of Jerusalem. He ate more meals there, as far as reported in the Bible, than any other town in the world. He spent more nights there than any other town in Israel. So this place meant a lot to Jesus. He was very familiar with this. <clears throat> Could you imagine if we announced tonight, for real now, that Jesus was passing through Hurdle Mills? I mean, literally, physically, Jesus, 7 o'clock tonight, passing through Hurdle Mills. Can you imagine the distance people would come? Could you imagine the folks that would turn out? Could you imagine the miles and miles and miles of highway that would have been blocked just because Jesus was passing by? 
But somehow Mary got so messed up that Jesus passed through her town and she didn't even go to see him. If you'll study the life of Mary, you'll find that she served Jesus. Mary and Martha would have Jesus into their home to eat. And it was there that Martha and Mary would prepare a meal for the Lord. Could you imagine the privilege and the honor of cooking a meal for Jesus Christ? And Mary did that on more than one occasion. She literally served Jesus. I'll tell you something else about her. Uh, this girl named Mary, she sat at Jesus' feet. You know how few people are recorded in the Bible of sitting literally at the very feet of Jesus? Can you imagine being so close to God that you could reach out and touch his foot? Here's a woman that cooked for Jesus. Here's a woman that Jesus had spent the night in her home. Here's a woman that sat so close to him she could literally touch the garment that he wore. Good woman, right? She not only did that, but she sacrificed for Jesus. Isn't it amazing that in my text that it notes that this was the Mary that anointed the Lord with the ointment? Why does it bring that up in the text? Because if you'll study that, that was a year's wages. She was a giver. She was a worker. She was a server. We would like to have a hundred of these in our church. Most churches have one, maybe two in their porch today. And so here's a woman. She's a good woman. She's a godly woman. She worshiped. When she broke that alabaster box, the Bible said the smell filled the house. I mean, she was public. She wasn't ashamed of Jesus. At one time, she served him. She fed him. She sat at his feet. She gave a year's wages to the Lord. And she had shouted no matter where she was. And now something has happened that she don't even go see. I want to preach tonight on something that's literally covering our churches in America. I want to preach on losing your momentum for God. Did you know this last year, through all this nonsense, and I don't even want to get into it, five of the biggest churches in our county have bellied up and are for sale right now. A realtor called me and said a $9 million facility. $9 million. Because we're packed and we can't get people in. He asked me if we wanted to buy it. They paid $9 million to have it built. They've paid, they've paid $5 million of it back. And when all this stuff hit, so many quit coming to church which meant so many people quit giving yeah, right. that they've lost their church five of the biggest churches in our part of Tennessee have for sale signs in front of them tonight I'm going back to churches now because churches are opening back up and they're starting to have revivals again and every church I go to the pastors are coming to me and telling me this family quit this teenager quit this dad don't come anymore this mother's quit and through all all the whatever has happened in the last year, people have lost their momentum for God. It's like they're out of gas. It's like they've got used to being out. Let me tell you something. It's easier to get out of church than it is to get back in church. I'm going to tell you that right now. you got to make, it's easy to fall out, but you got to make an effort to get back in the house of God. And if you're not careful, you'll lose your momentum. There are people out of church right now that I never dreamed in my life would ever be out of church. Preachers are quitting every week. I was talking to a preacher last week, preached for 47 years in one church. He's retired now, and he called me, and he said, I'm going off to this specific worldly situation. He said, I'm going to be gone for two weeks. I said, well, brother, surely there's a good church up there. He said, brother, kid, I'm so burnt out on church. I've pastored 47 years. I don't even go to church anymore. Now, how, how does a man preach on faithfulness for 47 years and then something happened that he doesn't even go and sell. Have you lost your momentum for God? Have you lost your zeal, your excitement? Man, remember when you couldn't wait for Sunday? You'd start getting ready on Saturday because, man, you wanted everything to be in order. Look at you now. You come dragging in late. Look like your mother-in-law just moved in forever or you're sucking vinegar through a BBC pipe. Hey, if you're happy, would you please tell your face about it? That's about what I want to say in half the churches I go to. 
and pastors are killing themselves trying to get their people back to where they were before all this nonsense happened. And preacher, I'm sure, and I'm not judging, but I'm sure you could probably come to me and tell me of some families that's drifted out of your church too. It's not that they're out in something wrong. They're just not into something good. You've got to be careful because the devil would love nothing more than to knock you out of the assembly and knock you out of fellowship and get you out of church. And once you get out of church, I'm telling you, it takes an effort in the Holy Ghost to give you that drive and draw to get back in again. I'm telling you, as a person, as a family, and as a church, nationwide, no momentum in our churches anymore. You can replace just about anything that happens in your church. You can, if a family leaves, you can win another family and replace them. If the piano player leaves, you can buy another one and replace them. You can all be replaced. If the sound man leaves, y'all be replaced. We don't need you. Get out of here. You'll find somebody else to replace. Well, that's your children, though, isn't it? It does all that. Well, get out of here anyhow. But I'll tell you one thing that's hard if you ever lose it and that's the momentum that's that fervency that's that zeal that's that expectation that's that next level man we're just glad to be surviving we're just in survival mode right now God never intended his church to be in survival mode we ought to be praying Lord plant my feet on higher ground we got to get out of this rut we got to quit looking yesterday we got to quit worrying about tomorrow and get our eyes back on God and get the power and the fire and the zeal back in our churches again now what is it that's knocked the fire out of so many people Jesus met them in a place called Bethany did you know Bethany means the house of affliction it means to suffer it means to endure it means to be hurt what's knocked a lot of our people out is they got blindsided with something we didn't expect. And because of that, it's thrown us on a journey we never thought we'd have to be in. I remember when all this stuff started happening in 2019, we made a decision as a church not to close. Never criticized the church for closing. That's why we're independent. You do your thing, I do mine. So we just decided as our church, we would clo- we're not close. I've got television. I'm on TV in 10 states. I didn't know how long churches were going to be closed. How do, how do you keep a television program up in 10 states? It's $15 a minute on television. You just can't throw money like that away. You've got to grow a lot of pot to, to, to pay for all this stuff. Too many of you laughed at that. I don't like it. I don't like it. Three men raised their hand. And so I, 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 I had to have church. If, I said, look, if you don't come, fine, stay home. It ain't a problem with me. I got to be down here to make a broadcast anyhow. Well, nobody quit coming. Next thing I know, the newscasters in the front of my church. And I went out there and this pot belly pug-nosed pig out there at a microphone. I said, hey, Jack, what are you doing on my property at microphone? He said, why have you shut the church down? You're a murderer. You're killing these people. They've not been vaccinated. How many masks are you wearing? How many pairs of gloves you got on? I said, look, you ain't my daddy, fat boy. Get off my property before I throw you out of here. I don't fool them idiots. They're all liberals. They all hate God. I'm not fooling with them. They put me on seven television stations. Seven television stations. Mad man refuses to close his church. Seven television stations. And they put me in three newspapers. Front page. Madman refuses to close his church. I come in the next Sunday. They had circled our buildings and shot all of our windows out with nine millimeter pistols. Left the shells laying all over our parking lot. Shot out every window we had. Called our church phone and said, I'm not only going to kill the preacher. I marked the place back in the parking lot where I'm going to bury that sorry sucker. And I went back there and he had spray painted four orange pegs and put them in the ground where he was going to bury me. They threatened to kill my wife, rape my grand. Bless my grandkids, kidnap my grandkids. For having church, I said. I'm not talking about selling them meth. I'm not talking about a crack house. I'm talking about going to church. Next thing I knew, I got a letter from the governor's office. He said, you're shutting your church down. I wrote him back. I said, I'm on television in 10 stations. I'm going to have every camera running. If you want to send a state trooper through my door and let them be put on television around the country that you shut down a church, bring them on, governor. I'm waiting on you. He wrote me in a letter and said, I understand where you're at. My biggest enemies were preachers. Preachers become my biggest enemies. 
because the first one that got a sniffle, they shut the church down and they had their head in a paper bag ever since. I don't know what in the name of God's happened to them. And everything has gone crazy. And now pastors are calling me, preachers, saying, how do I get my church back? How do I get my people back? Where's the fire? My people are discouraged. They're down. There's nothing to them. They won't stay there. What is going on? I can't get them back in church. You lose your momentum. Some of you here, bless your heart, I'm thrilled you're here. We're honored you're here. But if you don't get plugged back into God, you're going to lose everything you got as far as your momentum. Them. You're going to be the next one out. You're probably sitting in a pew right now where you remember somebody used to sit in that pew with you. Yeah. What happened? They lose their momentum. Something happens unexpectedly. Something comes along that afflicts them. Something comes along that hurts them. It knocks them out of the will of God. And the next thing you know, you can't find them in the house of God anymore. Momentum. And man, when the church loses that, even when sinners come, there's no conviction. Because there's no momentum. There's no excitement among the people. There's no fire in the song service. And we're beating our brains out trying to get our churches back again. Yeah. How can we get this back again? I don't want to focus on the problem. We know there's a problem. Mary is an illustration that some of the best people you got can lose their momentum. Yeah. The Bible said in verse 20, she sat still in her house. Now, I want to tell something about that. That is the only time that's found in the King James Bible. That term is so stout, it's never mentioned again in the King James Bible because it means to sit down with the intentions of never getting up again. Strong. And when people get out, it's hard. I remember my son, I, I'm old school, nothing spiritual about this, but I wear a suit everywhere I go. I cut my gray with a shirt and tie on. Change my oil with a shirt and tie on. Nothing spiritual. I'm trying to quit it. I've ruined so many shirts and ties. I'm tired of my wife cussing me. So, but I wear a shirt and tie everywhere I go. So my son decides he wants a pontoon boat. Two of the best days of owning a boat is the day you buy it and the day you sell it. Those are the best. You know why you're laughing? You've owned one. So he bought this pontoon boat. I don't know anything about boats. I never liked them. But he convinced me to go out on it with a suit on. So we're going across the water, 40 mile an hour, and I'm standing in the front with a suit. And everybody's taking pictures when I go by because they don't have enough clothes on to make a union suit for a gnat. And I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> and so my son had this round thing that looked like a tractor tire, and he throws it behind that pontoon, and there's handles all the way around it. And he said, Dad, get, jump in that thing, and you get up on it, and I'll pull you. Well, I've never been on nothing like that before, and I thought, man, what? 20 handles on this thing. Oh, did I find out why there's 20 handles on it. And brother, I jumped off the side of that pontoon. Wasn't anything to it. I just jumped out of it. Went swimming back there to this little tractor tire and I got on it. I said, okay, take off. Don't ever do that. Don't, don't do that. I know I'm born again. I got saved four times on that too. That sorry, unconverted son of mine opened up that thing straight the only thing of that pontoon that was in the water was the prop <laughs> he took me out across there and that tube was just skipping on the high places I know what the handles were for I had my feet under them my arms under them had my tongue wrapped around one of them and just when I thought it couldn't get worse here come a boat the other way again I'm not used to the water because I don't fool with it but behind every boat comes a wave after it goes by. And that unconverted, godless son I got whipped that pontoon around, slung me out this way, and I saw that wave coming, and that's when I got full assurance of my salvation. <laughs> that thing shot me 20 feet in the air. Honestly, I closed my eyes. I didn't think I was ever going to hit the water, and I sure didn't know if I was right side up or bottom side up. And when I hit that water, I yelled, Thank you, Jesus! As loud as I could. So I crawled off that thing and I told him, I'm going to kill you. I brought you in this world, I'm taking you out. I'm going to tell you something. It's hard getting back in the pontoon. You ever been on a boat and tried to crawl up out of that thing and get up in the boat? It's a lot easier to fall out of a boat than it is to crawl back back. You better watch church. 
With all that's going on, it's easy to slip through the cracks and kind of fall out and not be missed and, and not go back for a few weeks and get used to watching church at home or now you've got a computer pastor, right? And now Facebook's your pastor and God's never intended that to be for healthy people that could go to the assembly and be there with the people of God. And you're going to find out it's harder to get back. You need to make an effort. I promise you there are people here, you, make, you need to make a commitment. You know you're not where you're supposed to be. You know you're not where you used to be. And God has given you a couple of days of revival so that you can reconsider and get your life back on track with God. Now, let me give you something to think about. I want to give you three things that helps me stay in my momentum going forward for God. Let me give them to you quickly. Number one, you got to reunite yourself with the assembly. Mary never really got right with God till she went out in the cemetery and found Martha and got hooked up with the people again. She got help when she got in a group that was following Jesus. We need fellowship. You may think you're in isolation as Christian, but you need somebody to shake your hand once in a while. You need for somebody to say, hey, I was thinking about you or praying for you this week. You need somebody to sing songs beside you. You need to have that army prayer. You know how few churches do that anymore, Pastor? Just get around. Brother, that's cutting out. Put me on this, all right? Just getting around and having a season of prayer. We need to hear somebody say amen and worship God besides us. We need to see somebody else walk in with their Bible with a smile on their face and say, man, we made it another week. God is still good. He strengthened me. He encouraged me. He inspired me. I'm telling you, you can't stay right with God when you get out of church. When I was getting my doctorate degree, I did it on suicide. And I studied the Vietnam War. And I found out that in Vietnam, out of 58,000 men and women that came home in plastic bags, many of them killed themselves. We had a higher suicide rate during the Vietnam War than in any other conflict known in the history of our country. So nobody could figure out why so many young men were turning their rifles and shooting themselves in the face. So they took over some psychologists and they went over to the place where these men were out in the jungle and they did a survey. And here's what they found out. When the men would get out in the jungle, the problem was we couldn't discern who was on our side and who was the enemy because the Viet Cong and the Vietnamese looked identical. They were dressing identical. The men didn't know whether to hug them or shoot them. They were defeated before they ever got there. And then they had all kinds of restrictions. They wouldn't let them shoot. They wouldn't let them bomb. And our men were just setting ducks over there and women alike. So they found out that what would happen is the Viet Cong is they would shoot down from elevated places and get the troops to scatter. Once the troops scattered, what we call paranoia would settle in. They would be laying out there in the jungle by themselves, separated from the rest of the troops, and they would begin to think, everybody's dead but me. They've killed everybody in my troops but me. And they're not taking me hostage, and they're not tormenting me, and they're not hanging me and burning me and dragging my carcass down the road and sending a video to my family. So they turned their own guns and put it in their mouths and killed themselves. So what they did in Vietnam to solve that problem, and suicide went down to almost nothing when they did this, is after they would be in the jungle for a certain amount of time, they would call those troops back, pull them off the line, put new troops on the line. When they would bring the troops back, and some of you may have been in Vietnam, they would set those troops in a circle and let them realize that there were other people still in their troop that hadn't yeah. give up. And Sam would look at Dave and say, man, I thought you got killed. And Dave would look at Timothy and said, man, I thought you were down. And they found out that if they would let them assemble together, it would re-energize those guys, and they would grab their rifles after a day or two and say, Captain, we're ready. Put us in the jungle. It's just good to know we're not fighting this thing by ourselves. Yeah. That's why God instituted a church. We're in a battle, bless God. And then when you get out there all week, the devil will get you to think it. There's nobody left but you. But when you come here on Sunday and you see brother so-and-so over here and you see sister so-and-so still in the choir, the Holy Ghost will remind you, you're not in this on your own. God's army is alive and well. You've got to reunite yourself with the fellowship. Number two, you've got to release the way you really feel emotionally. When Mary got to Jesus in the cemetery, here's what the Bible said. They cried. The reason why some people move their, lose their momentum, they can't even be honest with God about the way they feel. 
Now, I don't have pity parties, but when I do, I can make demons cry. Now, I'm going to tell you, I know how to make people feel sorry for me. But one of the best days of my Christian life was the day I learned I could be honest with God about the way I felt. He's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. He will never tell anybody in public what you tell him in secret. I have went before him with a lot of issues, a lot of problems, and a lot of questions. Some of you have stuff bottled up in you that you've never even talked about to God, much less anybody else. But there's something on the backside of you that you've never forgiven. There's a bitter spot in your heart that nobody knows about but you and God. Somebody did you wrong. Somebody abused you physically, emotionally, mentally. Somewhere down the road you got burnt. Somewhere down the road somebody in your family that's got drama brought a problem into your family. And now your family can't even get together. Yeah. And you've never forgiven them. Yeah. Every family has a drama queen. Yeah. Every family has a drama queen. And the only reason why you're not laughing, you're the drama queen of your family. You cannot even get together with families anymore. Somebody's always been out of shape about something. I retired from embalming in January because I started feeling more like a referee than I did at embalmer. Families would fight in the funeral home. Grab each other's hair fighting over a warp skillet and a wore out quilt that wouldn't have brought two dollars at a yard sale. But it was grannies and they were fighting over it. And now the family. Y'all looking at me weird now. Y'all been fighting at funerals lately? Has somebody done you wrong? Somebody ripped you off? You say, but preacher, I I'm right in this. You might be right. But if it's knocking your momentum out of you, they're the winner. They're winning over you. You got to get right with God. You got to get it out. You got to get honest. I know what it's like to have bad feelings. My mother-in-law's still alive. And she's in good health. She'll never die. Tell her she'll live to be 150. I told my wife she'll spit on all of our graves. She's too mean to die. Hell don't want her and God won't take her. Sure, I've been depressed before. There's something about being honest with God. It's not only confessing sin, it's fault. It's not only just stuff that we do, it's things we think. It's stuff we've got in our heart. I was preaching in Lenore some time ago, and, and I, I just said something about this, and a silver-haired lady got up, a precious, precious elderly lady, and she walked to the altar while I was preaching and stood at the communion table crying so hard that I just had to quit. I walked out from the communion table. I said, honey, can I help you? Is, this, is something wrong? She said, sir, 55 years ago, 55 years ago, a drunk uncle did something to me that nobody should do to a little girl. I have hated him every day of my life. She said, I thought when he died, I would be happy and this would go away. But it's only intensified. I hate him more now than I ever have. And because of my unforgiveness and my hatred for him, I have never been the wife I should have been. I've never been the mama I should have been. I've never been the grandmother that I could have been. And I've never been the Christian. But after 55 years of carrying this junk, and it robbing me of fellowship and the anointing and the fullness of God in my life. I buried it back there in that pew. And I want everybody to know I got my first breath of fresh air for the first time in 55 years. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, if you come clean with God, he'll wipe it away. He'll give you your joy back. He'll give you your fire back. He'll give you your strength back. You just got to come clean with him. Number three, and I'm closing. I'm out of time and I want a cigarette. You ain't getting one. I'm taking it right now. <laughs> so the third thing you got to do is you got to make sure that you remove everything that's between you and God. Yeah. Now, on the other side of the rock was a miracle. Lazarus was about to be raised. And the only reason why Jesus hadn't already raised him is by the time he died, the girls had put a, something between them and their miracle. See, Jesus had a miracle ready for them. Yeah. But the girls had put something between their miracles. There was a blockage there. And Jesus, being the rock of ages, could have said to that rock, get out of here. Yeah. Right. And it would have been blown into oblivion. But here's what he was saying. You put it there. 
Now you move it. I've got a miracle waiting for you, but I'm not doing it until there's nothing between me and you. I want to close with this. I'm out of time. I forget when I started. I think I got three minutes. I, uh, I don't like dogs. I, I, I'm not anti-dog. They just hate me. I just, you, know, you know how many times I've got out of a car and people say to me, come on, that dog don't bite. <laughs> you know how many times I've heard that and I get back in with just my underwear on? <laughs> if a dog's got teeth, that sucker will bite. Yeah. Don't tell me your dog don't bite. And we have a mutual agreement. I don't like you. You don't like me. I'm done. So I'm not really a dog lover. But if you have one, you need to be good to it, of course. So I was studying something the other day, and, and it clicked over to dogs. I don't even know how I did it. And it clicked over to dogs. Talking about loving God and God loving you. And I'm done with this. Get your momentum back. So this guy and girl in Maryland goes down to, believe this sounds crazy, I'm just telling you the truth. There's adoption agencies for dogs now. So you go adopt a dog. They come to your home to make sure you're qualified. Now, you can have nine kids running around naked. They don't care. But if you're going to have a dog, you've got to qualify. Ah, God help us. So I'm telling you the truth, man. You've got to adopt a dog. And you gotta, it's got to have so many square footage, and it's, it's crazy. So this man and woman in Maryland goes to a, a pound, I guess, and they're getting ready to gas this dog. They keep him so long, then they kill him. So they go in. They don't know this dog. Dog don't know them. And the guy, and she, the guy said, look, don't, don't, don't put that one in line. I want it. And I got a picture of it. I'm 62 years old. It is the ugliest dog that God ever let breathe air on the face of this earth. That thing is so cross-eyed. A dog, cross-eyed dog. If it cried, tears would run down its back. <laughs> you would have to see this dog. Its name's Feline. P-H-E-L-I-N. Every hair is in a different direction. No two hairs flow. No. It's like it sucked on a socket and just got shocked. Every hair blew straight out. It looks like it's on crack. Its eyes are real big and crossed, and every hair is sticking straight out. If you got, I, I'm telling you, you've got to look it up. It's on the Internet. Its legs are that long, and they're about that big around. Now, Surely him and her were drunk when they adopted this dog. Could you imagine the next morning when they woke up and this thing was in the bed with them? So they got to love it on this dog that was unlovable. The reason why they were gassing it was nobody wanted it. He asked the people, what kind of dog is it? They said, you know what? We've even searched this on the Internet and taken blood. We don't know what this thing is. I mean, the vets don't even know what it is. It's, it's a freak. And so they just took it home. They knew nothing about the dog. The dog knew nothing about them. Next thing I know, brother, there's a national dog race in Florida. 116 of the fastest dogs in the world go to Florida to race. I look on the picture, there's feline. The cross-eyed mutt. Now, they're carrying feline past 115 dogs. Those dogs are worth millions. Their puppies are worth millions. And here comes a cross-eyed dog with legs that long and every hair in a different direction. Cross-eyed! And as they walk past those other dogs, you ought to listen to them snigger and laugh. That mutt is running this race. We don't even know what it is. That thing was headed for the gas chamber. Nobody wanted it. They let that thing go, and out of 116 dogs, guess who won? Feline. Fastest time ever in the history of dog racing across the finish line. A mutt that nobody wanted. They were getting ready to gas. There's no papers on her. There's nothing about her. To this day, they don't even know what kind of dog she is. All they know is she's the fastest dog in the world. They got the man and woman, they interviewed them. They said, could you tell us, is this why you adopted it? You saw something about its ability? They said, we didn't know anything about the dog. We didn't know it had any ability at all. They said, well, how did you get it, how did you get it to the momentum of this dog to, to get up and start going like this? She said, we just loved on him. We loved it when nobody else loved it. And the more we loved that dog, the more, the more momentum came in that dog's life. 
And the more we shared love with it, the more it shared love with us. And one day we threw a stick and it went out across the yard so fast it almost started the grass on fire. <laughs> we threw it over the fence and it jumped the neighbor's fence. And the one after that, and the one after that. And it was cross-sided, then it hit the fence, the one after that. <laughs> Today while I'm preaching, a mutt dog that we don't even know what kind it is, it's worth untold millions of dollars. And you know what brought out the best of that dog? It fell in love with its yeah. master, and its masters yeah. fell in love with them. Yeah. You know what kind of revival we need in our churches? We just need to fall in love with yeah. him all over again, yeah. receive the love of God that's been shed upon us, and it'll bring out more in us than we ever dreamed for his honor and glory. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you. Let's stand. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes are closed. Thank you, sis, for those beautiful songs. You did such a wonderful job. I wonder why the piano's playing. Let's just get down to where we're at. Quit playing games. Let's get serious. We got to get our fire back, church. We got to get it back as an individual. We got to get it back in our homes. We got to get it back in our churches. And it all starts with you coming clean, me coming clean, getting everything out of our lives, forgiving everybody that's ever done us wrong, getting anything out of your heart and mind that's between you and God, and fall in love with Jesus all over again. I wonder tonight, do you love him enough to step out of your seat and get on an altar and say, Jesus, I want to hit a reset button tonight. I want to get fired up again. I want to give you all of me again. I want that touch of God back on me again. I want to be able to cry again. I want to be able to worship again. My God, people can't even laugh anymore. People don't even know how to enjoy life anymore. They can't even laugh. Families are hanging on by a thread. Marriages are hanging on by a thread. Kids are going crazy, jumping out windows, doing stupid stuff. All you got to do, sir, is fall back in love with Jesus. I'm not asking for raising of hands. Why don't you do just like this family's doing? Why don't you get out of your seat right now? Come on, let's pray together. Oh, God, put the momentum. That's right. Come on. Teenagers, that's right. Come on. Come on. Don't wait on nobody else. You got songs? You got words for that song, brother? You got words for that song? Or are you just playing? Okay, sing it, brother. Come on, that's right. They'll let you out of the pew. Come on.